Good morning, West USA. Welcome to our Monday morning webinar. We're here each and every single week to help you grow uh, your bottom line as we grow our bottom ends. It's been a uh, rough week of, of eating, <laughs> but I celebrated this weekend. Didn't know what I was celebrating, but I should have be celebrating something the way. I, but anyways, that's not why people are here. Uh, anyway, it's a little sneak peek at what's on tap today. All right, we got Todd's look at the numbers. Man, we got Matt Baker here. Matt's here, yeah. Hey. Matt Baker's here from the Booksman Baker team to give us our Mortgage Minute. I'm going to oh, give man. you a uh, – my three-pack today is on tips for your next sales presentation, Ooh, things like to, to do that. and things to avoid, some of the things that may be the reason why you're not getting those listings. Uh, and uh, we got the Hoffs going to stop by for important updates you need to know about fix and flips. A lot of changes coming down the pipe, and so he's going to uh, grace us with his wonderful presence. Uh, as always, if you got any questions, comments, uh, if you have any suggestions of things that you'd like us to cover, uh, feel free to email us at webinar at westusa.com, and we will get to you in a very, very timely manner, unless it's negative. Then we're just going to yeah, ignore it. Do it. Just go yeah. right into junk. Yep. Never um, saw it. Yep. All right, Todd, give us a little sneak peek at what's going on in the market. Thanks, everybody. It's a pleasure to reach out to everyone this morning. Let's take a look and see what's happening for the last seven days. Uh, taking a look, today is Monday, February 25th, and here's the market analysis. 67 days on market for closed sales, 3.52 months supply. Absorption rate is at 28.44. Average list price, 548, 142. Average sale price is at 328, 541. And our list price to sale price retention is at 97.44, just a little bit low. Uh, taking a look at inventory across the board, we have active inventory at 19,254. We have pending at 55, that's up 9.3%. Looking at our closed inventory, we're at for the month, we're at 3651. And of course, that's month to date. So we'll see how that goes. But we are trailing 2018 numbers uh, for the same period by 8.3%. Taking a look at new listings as far as days on market is concerned, we're sitting at 151 days on market. And in relation to our closed days on market at 65. We took 2,038 new listings this past week, uh, which is down again approximately 10%. Looking at the ranges for price ranges, still under 500,000 continues to be the most dynamic and largest range by units. We're sitting at a total of 79 days on market, and it's making up approximately 73% of the entire inventory. Uh, between 500 and a million is sitting at only 17.5%. But if you have properties in those price ranges, uh, those are at about 114 days on market. And finally, above a million dollars in market, we're sitting at 188 days. Uh, and it only represents, that's all prices above a million dollars in the MLS only represents represent just short of 9.6% uh, of the entire market. So taking a look at the Excel spreadsheet that we do, uh, which shows our week over week and our uh, last 90 day picture, uh, we have 2038. You'll see we were down from 2300 last week. Uh, active inventory is down to 19.2 from 19.6. So again, we're down uh, just a little bit in that regard. Uh, taking a look at pending, uh, we're, this is a good sign because pending, we're up to 5,500 in pending. Uh, last week, we were at 5,000. Uh, just a month ago, we were at 4,900. Um, and again, just to let you know about it, you know, 10 months ago, we should be somewhere climbing closer to the 5,800. Uh, we're looking for six or 7,000 is the premium number, but we haven't seen that in at least 12 months. Taking a look at close across the board for the month to date, we're at 3651. Last year we were at 3983, same period. Uh, but as you can tell, we're doing relatively well. Uh, we're climbing up near the end of February. It's a short month, and of course, uh, our goal is to you know stay ahead. If you look in the left side, you'll see the W slash W way up in the top blue, and if you that's week over week numbers. And if you look down when we get to close, which is included in the red bar, you'll see it changes to year over year. So what we're really looking for is how do, uh, is the current period comparing to a year ago today? Um, and that really helps out a lot because, you know, again, there's seasonal things. You know, 
obviously up until, you know, April, it doesn't, maybe May, it doesn't really get warm. So as a result, what ends up happening is we still have a lot of, uh, second home buyers in the marketplace uh, and what's happening during that particular period of time, you know, is the same as it was last year during this same period. So again, those are the reasons why we look at the two periods this way uh, is one of the more important ways to take a look. Taking a look at statistics at the bottom, month supply is at 3.52. Anytime we are between three and four, this is the sweet spot uh, of sales because it means that sales are a little brisk, uh, better than the normal four to six, which is your average. Um, so instead of being more in a seller market, when you're between three to four, you're in a uh, very brisk market. If you put your property on the on the market, it's going to sell quickly. However, if it drops below three, then usually there's pressure placed on the sale prices uh, because of the demand. So three to four is the sweet spot of the bat. You can see it equals about 28.44 absorption rate. That's how quickly we're actually eating up the inventory. Um, and again, average list price is sitting at 548. Uh, this fluctuates significantly. However, if you slide your eyes across, you can see we, you know, 548 was last year uh, in January's price. So this is, you know, again, just a little bit below uh, where we would like it to see at this particular point. Sale price is at 328.5. Taking a look at inventory, as we said before, um, you know, we're averaging for that sold 66, 67. We like to see that right about 70 leading into April. So we're a little ahead of the market. Um, so that's still saying that those are good numbers. And then finally, looking at the list price to sale price retention, um, this is at the time in offers written what the difference was between the list price at that time that it was accepted, excuse me, and the actual sale price on that contract. So normally it should be right about 2.2% which means it should say 97.8. Anytime we're a little lower, the seller's giving up a little more. Anytime we're a little higher, that means the seller isn't giving up as much. So they can and can't, maybe they need to, they don't. But these, you take these factors, you add them together and you have a great picture, Mike. You have an excellent picture on what's taking place in the market. So if anybody has any questions about this, they will be on the dashboard uh, for your use. And also uh, just email me if you need to have any additional information or would like uh, some explanation. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> oh, one more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gee, hey, is, hey, you know what? <laughs> this looks like I flatlined. Yeah, this thanks. Is <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Actually, uh, I, I remember putting this in uh, at the last minute because one of the things that we have. Uh, so what happens you know, when you get your stuff it, to us it, ahead it really, of time. I know. I know. <laughs> Uh, and the thing is, is that we're dealing new home sales data. And I think this is really important, not for just, uh, you know, the people that are working the new home uh, division, but this is important for every resale agent that's out there. If you take a look at 2018, 2019 in the red, and the, as you can see at the top, and then I've broken down the different uh, colors to be different times. And the things that I think are, are really important really important uh, with regard to this is the fact that, um, you know, you can see the trend of model plans, models only, specs, and move in ready on the left-hand side, and then finally close out. And one of the reasons that I wanted to provide this was because you can see that if you run out of resale inventory, specs and move-in ready homes close typically about the same time as a regular resale would. So you're not bringing somebody to a new home subdivision and then waiting 10 months for your commission. This is something where you can actually bring property, bring them to properties that are ready to move in. Uh, and this is very, very important. The difference between a spec and a move in is a spec could be anywhere from the time at which an offer is written to the time it actually breaks ground. Um, so again, you know, or till it actually closes, to be honest with you. So it could be at any stage of the process. That's why I try to focus on move in ready as a separate number. So as you take a look down at the red, each of these different colors of the different portions, quadrants of the valley, but the red at the very bottom is the total. So let's slide our eyes all the way over to, to February. And what we're basically seeing is that there is approximately 2,326 specs out there. 1,027 of them are move-in ready, which means we have another 1,000 homes that are out there available. Now, if you look at Armless, which is the one that popped up in the big blue hi highlighted area with the arrows, you'll see it says there's 2,084 properties in Armless right at this particular time. Some of them may be spec move-in ready. Some may not be. Some may just be builders that are trying to tell you about new product they have available. In either case, the point is, is that you have at least two maybe 3,000 additional properties that aren't showing up when you do a stereotypical search. So take a look. If you're looking at, uh, if you're trying to find out where these properties are, if you go to the products tab 
in your armless dashboard under flex, you'll see that there's uh, two sources, one that's called RL Brown, one that's called uh, that, that's called New Home Source Pro. And both of those are new home sales searches uh, that you won't find in the MLS. All right. Appreciate it. As always, Todd. Yeah, and you can always, as always, find these on the dashboard later on this afternoon uh, to use at your will. All right. We're going to bring Matt Baker here from the Bookspan Baker team. Matt, welcome. It's tough to follow, man. There's a lot of good, a lot of good detail there. Yeah, man. it is. It is. So uh, we'll see if you can't. We'll and it's always tough to follow Mick, right? So, you know, Mick comes here normally. And so it's like, what do I do? I got to come with some maybe some good stuff. So we're hopefully... going to start initiating some hazing. Like if you lose the battle, then, right. yeah, then we're going to take you out back. Yeah. I need to make things. sure I bring it. So let's go. Let's <laughs> talk market. Um, interest rates. You know, they've been trending about their best they've been in all in a year. So for you know, fat, look back to about this time, January, February of 2018, and that's sort of where rates are. So there's really a good opportunity um, for people to possibly refinance if they purchased in the last year. Um, and you've had, uh, as Todd pointed out, such good um, you know market improvement uh, in terms of of uh, you know. Uh, you know, appreciation. So 4.625 on a conventional um, with a 5.218 APR. I mean, I think the key thing here is if you look at over at Jumbo, gosh, Jumbo is just phenomenal right now. So that's anything over the, you know, basically the 484, 350 mark. Uh, and you can see that the APR is still pretty low at the 4.535. So, you know, right now, um, FHA and VA again are hovering in the five and the, and the 475. So when you're thinking about, um, um, your borrowers getting pre-qualified, um, making sure they they do that ahead of time and know where they are. Uh, that's probably the most important thing. And then let's just, uh, I know this is uh, past Valentine's Day, but thought this was really interesting when I saw it. And this is, comes from Keeping Current Matters. Um, I love their stuff, but they talk about um, when when does mortgages, you know, when do people first time buy, right? And so um, they're all saying of all the first time home buyers out there, your household income 75,000, your median age is 32. What's interesting is that the married couples obviously make up of all first time home buyers make up 54% of that, that pie. And then you've got the unmarried couple of 16%. Of course, the single female at 18% and then the single male um, maybe lagging separately. Um, but what I liked about this was that this is a kind of maybe a little snapshot of maybe you should target like where the marketing tip, where would you maybe, where would you find potentially unmarried couples and married couples, which would equate to almost 70%. Where would you, um, you know, where would you, where would you find those? And I thought of initially just, you know, engagement photographers, right? Yeah. Um, because they're not married yet. And in, in, if this stat's correct, 70% of the, of the first time home buyers are going to be made up of the, of that potential group, new married to pay, you know, future married. So thought this was a really interesting stat figured I would, uh, I would share. Well, I, what I would do then maybe go out and get my, uh, my ordination papers in check. And so now I can <laughs> marry people. That's yeah. part of the home yeah. buying wow. process. I'll marry. <laughs> Um, I, buy the I'm house glad I brought this here today because <laughs> yeah. I knew you were going to be able to. Yeah, we'll, find we'll do the, the wedding in the backyard. This the home perfect. that you choose. This is perfect. <laughs> this is the this is marketing genius in in the making. So, and and so let's talk about a little bit about a program that Fannie Mae uh, has. It's called Home Ready, and I know Mick has maybe talked about this program before. But what maybe he hasn't addressed is is how some pockets of the valley are um, unrestricted in terms of income limits. And so what this wow. what the what what is home ready? It's basically a program that Fannie and then Freddie has a, a Freddie Mac has a, a mirrored program called Home Possible. But essentially what these two programs allow you to do is as minimum of 3% down. So you can do 97% financing, but it has a reduced not only interest rate, but also mortgage insurance rate. So it allow allows sort of a, a, a double whammy in terms of of savings versus just your normal Fannie Mae loan. And you're like, well, what's home ready? mean? Well, it does have some income restrictions in certain areas. So if you click to the next one, Mike, you'll see that there's a map. So if you go to this uh, home ready dash eligibility dot com forward slash home ready, super long, we can post that. You, you can actually go you know very granular into the communities and say, well, you know, if you have a listing, is your listing uh, home ready uh, eligible, right? Meaning, meaning not that it's eligible because you can do a home ready loan anywhere, but it, it puts restrictions. If you click the next one, we'll go granular on it. You can see this is just a 
an area in Arcadia. Of, of course, there's income limits, which you'll never find in this area, <laughs> but, but, you'll, but you'll see that there are these, but you'll find these zones, right? Yeah. And so there's no income limit zones, which is like Old Town Scottsdale, for example. You can, you can buy the Home Ready program and you have no income restriction. And so, wow. you know, from, from a taking advantage perspective, one, first of all, most big box bank loan officers not going to talk about this program. They're not going to have that 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 detail knowledge. So getting them pre-approved with you know with Fairway Mortgage, um, any anyone anyone really that's that specifically does mortgage loans can really go granular on this and and help. And it's also the idea of getting pre-approved ahead of time. But the but the savings could be a hundred and fifty dollars a month or more, depending on the you know your price versus because again you're getting a, a bump off the rate. So your rate improves your and your MIP yeah. goes down. And so there's really a, a major benefit um, for, for doing that and, and educating the borrower, especially the first time home buyers that are really looking at that 3% down program as an option. This is a good way to go. Yeah, it's a fantastic program. And I would say it's, a, I mean, it's a lot to chew on in, in just a couple minutes. Sure. So I would just say for, I mean, it's, it's something that all of us as, as real estate agents need to be acquainted with, really need to understand what our options are, how to sell it, how to present it to our buyers. And so I just encourage anyone who's really interested in this program to sit down and talk with you guys. Yeah, I think come talk to us. And then if you're a listing agent and and you have a, a listing that's in an income or no income zone, I mean, I think that there there's an absolute advantage to marketing that that nobody's doing. All right. And then also, right. you, know, you know, for those of us uh, that want a co-branded flyer, this is information. Uh, again, this is information you should be sharing with your buyers, but you got to make sure you can answer the questions and you, that you understand the information. But then back to your earlier point, I mean, you know, there's a lot of a uh, lot of trade shows that go on for marriage, people getting married oh, yeah. and, and, and things like that. And uh, I mean, I, you know, I mean, with those numbers, those numbers are astonishing. And we really should be taking a look at it. I mean, you, there's a lot of different events, a lot of different vendors. You know, we need to figure out how to. I mean, yeah, you, you talk about a photographer. Okay, you buy a house, and you know, maybe your closing gift is is a contribution to the photography package or yeah, something like you that. Go. You know, yeah, I mean, alignment alignment with those engagement photographers and saying, hey, let's you know, you refer some clients over, and I can I can work out a package this deal on your closing, right? Totally. And, and like, there's total you can build a whole network. There. It just yeah. in, inside oh, that niche. space. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And it's a good percentage of the first time home buyer market. So, yeah. And then the other thing is, if I'm going to a bar, I'm going to focus on the single women instead of the single men. Well, the they, single they, men they, are buying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We're a little slow at the table. Yeah. 10%. I don't know. 54%. I'm sticking with the married. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, Matt Baker, thank you very much. Uh, tell us real quickly about the Booksman Baker team difference. Oh, I'm telling you about this. Well, get pre qualified. <laughs> make a make always pick. Yeah, yeah. Always, make make always picks one of them. One. Dang it! So he let's see really picked the same one. Uh, let's see if I pick. The, well, you know what? Get pre approved. Okay, oh, wow. let's get pre approved. We have access to a system that we can send you pre quals 24 hours, yeah. seven days a week. Let's get pre approved ahead of time and make sure your buyers qualify, and uh, you'll be happy. All right, Matt Baker, thank you very much. Hey, uh, hey, you did a subpar job. Fantastic! Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> You're not going to invite me back. <laughs> You're the boss. Yes, that works. No. <laughs> All right, little uh, little uh, tips for your next sales presentations, Todd. Whether we're talking about uh, listing presentations or buy buyer presentations, uh, so going to give you some things to avoid, some things cool. to really uh, focus on, uh, because I just think sometimes we're very robotic. We do. We well, get, hopefully, we do have we a get, presentation. Well, no, but we get into those yeah. rhythms, yeah. So yeah. If we don't have one, we wing it. All right. So the first one is when you're sitting in front of a prospect, focus on the solutions and the solutions only. So don't. And what I mean by that is don't hesitate to leave features out or gloss over them. If, if you're having a conversation with a buyer or a seller and they're talking about the things that are important to them, you don't have to cover every single thing in your presentation. There, you know, you, you want to be relative to them. Prospects only care. Well, that leads to that point, prospects mm -hmm. only care about what's relevant to them. They're True. looking for someone to solve their problems. And also, and, and the best way to do this is avoid jumping right into your presentation. If you show up for a listing presentation and you're not taking a tour of the home and you're not having a conversation with that potential seller, uh, you're just, all it is, is just a, a presentation. Yeah. Um, but if you take time to listen and take time to ask the right questions, 
uh, then they're going to identify their pain points. They're going to identify their problems for you so you can focus on the solutions. And this is sometimes, you know, when, you, when, you're, you, when you're stubborn and you're hell-bent on this is in my presentation, this is what I've prepared, and you just insist on going over it, sometimes you're, you're not speaking to them and they're not listening to you because they just want to be heard. Yeah. And the best way you can let someone know that they're being heard is by focusing on what they're telling you. Totally. You know, there, this is just like any other presentation that you've got 40 years of experience or whatnot, and you really want to let these people know how experienced you are versus maybe somebody else that they've had over. And the reality is it's the exact wrong thing to do. You know, the best thing is always uh, come prepared, even if it, even if you have questions written out, that it's the same questions you, you know, you use all the time. If you don't know questions to ask, talk to your coach uh, or talk to a coach. Uh, but, you know, it's very, very important that, you know, I think the, I like the last one, avoid jumping right into the presentation. If you haven't created any common ground with people yet, you're not being heard. You're, you know, you're just another realtor in front of them. However, if you slow down and, you, and just like Mike said, you go out and you tour that, you know, their home. It, one of my favorite comments when I was a listing agent is I'd walk through the door. Thank you very much for having me over tonight, Mike. You know, listen, before we get started, would you be kind enough to demonstrate for me your home? Show me your home like you would want me to show it to a prospective buyer. And if they can do that, that is a mental uh, neurolinguistic yeah, thing that, that if they can see you doing it, you've pretty much already got the listing mentally if they if they walk you through that house. Yeah, my my I down. guess my problem was is is I would ask them to show me their pantry and their refrigerator, <laughs> <laughs> and then you rate them based on what they have inside. Perfect. <laughs> All right, number two, go and, and this is I mean this is similar to number one, but go in the direction of the conversation. Uh, don't be afraid to ditch your presentation again. Avoid being stubborn. If you know you you'll never know. Uh, what a what a, a prospect, what direction they want to take the conversation in, what they're really caring about, what their motivation is for making whatever decision. You know, you could be going into a listing presentation and really they don't want to sell. They may just want to rent out that ho house and, and they really want to focus on buying. And you got you just got to you got to go in the direction where they're taking it as long as it's in. The realm of, of real estate uh, but the prospect may focus on a different topic or a different area and again you got to be able to roll with the punches you, you got to be able to, to, to go in the direction that they want to take the conversation because the moment that they feel like you're being stubborn and not listening uh, you've lost the battle and they're gonna tune you out well it's kind of like a presentation it was designed in the old days for us to stay on target but if you, if you consider a 26 page report as being from A to Z you know and you want to go a B C the customer says to you oh can you tell me about H first I really want to know about H and you go well I will get there I'm only on B or C you know what you're demonstrating is you're not listening to them and you're not being able you should be able to go A C B Q R L M Z Y you know and and as long as in the end of the presentation that you've basically covered all the things that should be covered uh, by your license um, then then you should be fine but but allow just remember and then the other piece I'd like to give you is this uh, if you ask one question, they give you an answer and you go to the next question, you're not demonstrating that you care. Yeah. You really need to ask twice, maybe three different questions like, Mike, why do you feel that way? You know, and what would it, you know, how does that, inter how does that, uh, 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 not interfere, but how does that, how is that part of this process? What would happen if that wasn't to happen? You know, and so just a couple of quick questions, you can find out really if somebody says, yeah, that's important to me. But, if, you know, you ask two more questions and you find out it's not as important to them as this other thing was important. Yeah. To them. So it helps you prioritize. All right. Well, then that's a, that's a great segue uh, for the third point is take notes. Uh, bring a pad folio, bring a, a notepad. Uh, you, I, you know, it's like I went to, uh, went out to dinner last night, uh, and the, the waiter showed up taking everybody's order, not writing things down. And I know chef Ramsey doesn't like that, yeah. but I, I want my order coming out right the first well, time. Right. Yeah. And, and it's just, and it, it and it stresses me out, <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, he's not going to get the order right. And he didn't. He, he couldn't get everything right. Yeah. And you, you should be taking notes when you're dealing with a prospect, a buyer or a seller. It shows, one, that you're paying attention. Uh, two, it will help you, uh, you know, it'll help you stay organized on the topic and what the things are important to them. You can have information that you can recall at a later date um, because you're, you can't remember everything that they're going to say. You have information that you can be putting into your CRM system. But focus, when you are taking notes, focus on their objections. Totally. 
Um, you know, you, we, we really need to be in the habit of listening for people's pain points. What are those, what are the things that are important to them? Is it schools? Is it neighborhoods? Is it, you know, is it, is it one story versus two story? What, whatever they can find out what it is that their problems are, their real estate problems are. And, and then as you're taking those notes and you're writing them down, then you can also begin to, to, to form those solutions because sometimes yeah. you'll say something. I'm like, okay, I need to say something back at you, but I, I this is not the time because I'm going to let the conversation go where it needs to go. I don't want to forget that that important point that I want to make. So I want to write that down. And then again, listen for their personal information. This is when you learn about anniversaries where where kids are going to college and what, what their pets' names are and what their hobbies are. Write all of that stuff down. No, I, you know, that's a tough one. I, there's not a lot more here uh, to this particular uh, topic number three, take notes. Uh, but again, it is one of those things that remember you need to be sincere. And if you ever have a problem with people saying that you're not maybe sincere, uh, and maybe you don't know this, maybe you haven't done a 360 evaluation on yourself yet. But if you have, uh, this is one of those ways, just this tool alone, taking notes can make you appear to be more sincere. All right. Uh, so that's our three pack. Uh, again, if you like copies of the slides, you can email us at webinar at westusa.com. They will also be on the dashboard later on this afternoon. A few announcements. Uh, I, I'm even hesitating to really announce this because we're pretty much pretty much packed out on this. Um, but we do have uh, some sponsors that have bought some tables that that do have some some seats available. Uh, so if you are interested in still uh, attending our power lunch for team leaders tomorrow, uh, email us at webinar at westusa.com and uh, we'll try to introduce you to a, a, a sponsor and get you at a table. You probably could still buy a ticket because uh, we're not going to say no to your money. Uh, but uh, there is a, there's yeah, probably that, that $5. Yeah, yeah I know. I did, <laughs> hey, every, every dollar counts, Bobo. Yeah, no, uh, but this is a great opportunity for those of you who are running teams. Um, and for those of you that are thinking about running teams, this is your chance to hear from other team leaders as well as Commissioner Lowe on the topic. And get fed. Yeah. And get fed. You're you're coming out ahead. This lunch is fantastic. You're coming out ahead on this. So that is going on tomorrow. Uh, I know that we're going to turn off uh, turn off the actual registration sometime today. So, um, all right. So we got a couple CE classes coming up on Tuesday, February 26th at the Chandler office, delivering the ultimate listing presentation. Okay, so it's fantastic. So take in mind the three pack that you just heard, yeah. and and go in and, and sit in this and and figure out how to put it all together to, totally. to make your listing presentation even more effective. Uh, but you can go to westusace.com. Do not hit the red button on your computer screen. That's not going to work for you. <laughs> um, and you can get registered for this and get in and, and as well as getting these are the types of CE classes that I love because yeah. you're going to get your CE hours, but you're also going to get some information that's really, really relevant to, to what we need. Absolutely. Uh, also, uh, Disclosure Jeopardy, uh, February 28th as well here at the corporate office our facilitator is the one and only larry hibbler uh again you can go to westusace.com to register for this one uh, and you can get your pick up your three ce hours of disclosure so that's coming up next week as well or is that this week uh, that's this week that? that's huh? this week yeah, I, don't thursday, what, yeah. I don't even know what yeah. day well, it it's is. the last day of the month yeah okay that's right and it's I not know. leap year i know jeez all righty. So we got a couple. <laughs> yeah. We need more coffee. Know, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting. It's going from 10 to 9. This makes all the difference it, in the it's, world. It's amazing. All different. right. Uh, I, we've got a couple lunch and learns. We're rolling out a brand new uh, uh, lunch and learn topic on dominating the neighborhood. So once you take a listing, what do you do? How do you meet the neighbors? How do you develop a strategy in order oh, wow. to meet the neighbors? As you know, that and I know Hoff will agree with this, the open houses are not really specifically designed to meet buyers no. as much as they are to meet the neighbors and to get and to get listings. Marketing feedback. So how do you do it? Yeah. So we're going to teach you how to do it. So That's we've got awesome. two of these. So one is Wednesday, March 13th at the Chandler office. Uh, this one's going to start at noon, uh, but don't fear. We're going to eat first. Uh, you can email, you can uh, RSV to Chandler at westusa.com to get signed up for this one. 
And then on March 14th, the next day, starting at 1130, we're going to do the exact same thing at the Mesa office. And you can RSVP to Mesa at WestUSA.com. It's be a fantastic class. I'm really excited about it. When's it coming to the West Side? Um, well, I've, I put, uh, I've asked all the office managers. Okay. I've made myself available. Just asking all if, the if you think managers. you'd like to have this class out at your office, please talk to your office manager to get in touch with mine. But you can, uh, you can go to either of those. doesn't matter what office you're out That's of. That's true. And I think we have one coming up on the West side, don't we, Sydney? Yes. Okay. okay. All right. But we don't have, it's a little farther yeah, out. That's fine. All right. We got to the Hoff. Bum, 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 bum. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. All right. So, uh, so as always, um, appreciate you taking the time to uh, be with us and to be with our agents. Um, so we want to talk about fix and flips today. Right. Um, and some of the changes, some of the things that, that we need to be, uh, you know, we need to be aware of. So I'm just going to hand you this. You just press the space bar and take it away, buddy. OK. Well, I want everybody to know that this is really not a change. Um, it's in the law, so I put the law up there right there, ARS 3211-21. It's been around for a while. However, what's really changed is that they're enforcing it more. Yeah, yeah. So as a broker, we've always applied this to more new homes in a sense of, so this law allows people, if you're the public, to go out there and build the house yourself. You can act as your own general contractor, well. right? Yeah. So you can buy the lot, you can... Um, Hire all the subs you want, do whatever you need to do, get your grading and drainage, get your, you know, lot, everything set up and you don't need a general contractor and you can move into that property. However, this law clearly states that you cannot sell it within a year. So that's the big issue of, of, of the certificate of occupancy. Right. right. So yeah. once you get, once you move in and you got that certificate of occupancy, you have to wait one year, one full year, and then you can sell it or rent it. You can't sell it or rent it within that year. Now, this doesn't specifically state that it is a new home. So this has to do with resales too. Mm. And the reason why this is so big right now is because we've had so many fix and flips and we've had so many complaints. So the ROC, which is a register of contractors, they said, you know what? This is such a big problem uh, that we're going to step in and we are going to help the public in this sense. So their job as an ROC is the same thing as the Department of Real Estate is to protect the public not to protect the contractors or protect the realtors out there is to protect the public. So we know there's a lot of realtors actually out there doing fix and flips. Yeah. And I would say, you know, once we finish talking about this law, you realize, I mean, over 90% of them aren't hundred percent legal <laughs> uh, because they're missing <laughs> stuff in them. And um, I, it could be more than that. Once I talk about one document, which I know no one ever does, but you know, when we're talking about this law, who does it apply to? So it applies to really anyone out there. Um, and if you're building a house or if you've owned the house for 10 years and you're going to say, all right, I'm going to fix it up. I'm going to put 30 grand, 40 grand, 50, whatever you're going to put into it. Um, you can do that without this law applying to you. So you could fix it up, do whatever you need to. It's just only if you're going to sell it and rent it within a year of completion of that work. That's the big issue. But now, if you, so, so if you did it and you and you weren't really planning on selling, you just figured you'd do it. And then two months later, maybe there's a gray area. But if you did it because you wanted to update your home to make it more current with what's going on with the market so you can sell it, then it does apply. Correct. Okay. Well, I just want to make sure. I so the, in, and I went down and met with the ROC and asked him details. So I, I met an investigator down there and talked to him about, you know, what are the different options? What are the thoughts? And, you know, how are they looking at it? Uh, one thing right now, they are looking for permits. So um, mm. they're different than the uh, Arizona Department of Real Estate. So Arizona Department of Real Estate will only work off a complaint. The ROC can investigate and go look for things. So that's what they're doing right now. They're saying, hey, if we get you know a couple permits pulled for here or there on that property, well, we better check out if there's a GC there. You know, or does that property up for sale? So I know they're proactively. So don't pull permits. So don't apply for permits. Just do without <laughs> permits. <laughs> We know we're going to check out Mike after the, <laughs> the meeting here, but um, permits will trigger sometimes for them to check up and see if the property is going to be sold or leased within a year. Now, the question is, you know, what if I want to fix up my house and then all of a sudden six months from now, you know, I get a job transfer or I get offered a job and I need to move. Can I sell my house or rent my house out? Yes. So the way they're going to look at this law is what was your intent 
when you were fixing it up or, or doing whatever you need to to it. So if you own the property, you're fixing it up and you don't use a general contractor, um, then you can sell it in six months if for some reason you get a job transfer or something moves without having to worry about this law. You see what I mean? So was my intent when I fixed this up to sell it? No, my intent was to fix this property up because I've owned it for 10, 20 years. And then I just happened to have an opportunity to sell it within that year. They're not going to go after that. They'll investigate it. They they know. You mean keep records of emails and, and everything else because they will fully investigate it. So and, and that rolls over to the next slide here. What we're talking about is a handyman exemption. So even if you were fixing up the property yourself and you don't plan on selling or renting it out within a year, Anything over a thousand dollars, you're going to have to use a general contract. I mean, a, not a general, but a, a regular licensed contractor. So any work that's coming in. Although, if you're doing electric work on the property or plumbing work on the property, um, that's pretty extensive. Uh, other than just changing out some cover plates or whatever, you're going to need a, a contractor anyway. Is a specialty, right? Gotcha. So, um, but the handyman can come out and do up to a thousand. Then that's without a licensed handyman out there. Now they do have a license for a handyman that's out there, and I believe it goes up to five thousand dollars now. So a handyman can get licensed, and it can go up to five thousand. But you know that's a whole different story there. But typically, you're going to want to use a general contractor for all the work that you're doing, and save their information for if you do sell it or whatever. Uh, but that's the handyman exemption. It is a thousand. Now it's in aggregate. So a lot of people think that, you know, well, I'll hire one guy for this for 800 bucks, another guy for this, 800 mm -hmm. bucks. Well, there's 1600 bucks there. You are not go following the law at that sense um, because aggregate and that's material and labor. Mm. It's on it. Now, a homeowner can do his own work. You know, that's kind of scary, right? He needs to do electrical or plumbing or something like that. He actually technically can go do his own work um, if he doesn't plan on selling it within a year. Um, but. I mean, if the work is going to be some extensive adding electrical to a property, whatever, they're going to want to use a, a licensed contractor uh, for that. One thing that's good is if you're a property manager and you have a property that you're managing and it needs a lot of work on the property, you are exempt from this law, um, not from using a licensed contractor, but uh, – renting the property out within a year. So you're allowed to fix up the property. Again, you need to use licensed contractors, but you can fix up the property um, and you don't need a general contractor, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So a, hold on, this is a, a, maybe an interesting revenue source for property managers is uh, when you're talking with uh, investors and people who want to flip or people who want to you know, buy something and then run something out, they can't do it themselves. Right. But you use me as a property manager and for, you know, and make that part of my services. Yeah. It'll work for rentals. It won't work for sales. Okay. So we'll work for rentals. So it, it a property manager can fix up the property and re-rent it again within a year, uh, but they can't fix up the property and sell it because they're a property manager. You see? So it's a different ball game if they are going to turn around and sell it because if they're selling it, well, depending on the work that they're doing, they might need a general contractor, which we'll, we'll go in a little bit more detail later. So it is, it is, but um, at the same time, just know if you're a property manager out there, you are exempt for fixing it up as much as you want to and then re-renting it again uh, within that year. And that's typically what's good out there. So that gets rid of the uh, property manager exemption now. Now we're talking about licensed contractors and the use of licensed contractors. If the work – now, let's say you're replacing carpet in the house and it's $3,000 for carpet. Do we need a licensed contractor to do that? Yes. Can a seller replace all the carpet in there himself without using a licensed contractor? Yes. Um, same thing holds true for paint. If you're paying three or $4,000 to paint up your house, do I need a licensed contractor? Yes, if you're hiring someone. Mm -hmm. But can a homeowner do it himself? Yes, without a licensed contractor um, to do that. However, let's say I'm going to put new carpet in and I'm going to paint my house. But I'm going to sell it within a year. Can I do that? Not really. Because you're going to need a licensed contractor because that work is over $1,000 and you're selling it within a year. That's where this law applies. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't, don't really apply the law to that aspect. And I don't think the ROC... You know, from talking to investigator, it's going to go after somebody 
who just painted their house, yeah. you know, completely right. on that. But if it's you put gonna, a wing on it or you did a major remodel or something like that. It's going to be electrical, yeah. plumbing, heating, cooling. Yeah. That's what they're really talking about. Uh, roof is another big issue. I mean, I can't tell you as a broker how many times a, a seller will go up and replace the roof himself, Ooh. you know, like shingles um, or take the tile off and put new underlayment down or something like that. And then the buyer moves that in. sounds like a lot of work. Or, 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 <laughs> I'm out. Or, or put a third layer over the second layer. <laughs> you know, I don't even want to mow my yard. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's crazy because, you know, and they don't disclose it in the spuds. So they go up and do all oh. this work. And, you know, of course, the neighbors are going to talk. Oh, yeah, I saw Bob up there. He was up there replacing and putting new shingles on. So it is problematic. Um, What's that ch chalk outline? <laughs> well, top fell off the roof. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that that's where a use of a general contractor is recommended. And, and the whole reason I'm bringing this up as a broker and how does this apply to us as agents is if you know this is going on and you don't say anything to them, that's a problem. So we already have a couple of lawsuits right now. Uh, that are in this realm. And that's why I'm bringing it up is that our agents knew about the fix and flip. Mm -hmm. They knew the seller did all the work himself or hired unlicensed contractors. We had one that they hired, they paid 20 grand to this guy who was unlicensed to go out and do all this work on the property. Well, okay. Same scenario. But you know, again, age, the, the guy uh, goes out and gets subs to do it that are licensed, but it goes over the, the amount and, and the intent was still to sell it. That's still the problem. Right? That's still the problem. Yeah. Is if you're going to sell yeah. it within a year after completion <laughs> right. of work or the certificate of occupancy. Yeah. But even if you use the, the licensed contractors, you've got to have that GC. You have That's to have that key. GC. Right. Yeah. That's what I'll be talking yeah. about next. Okay, cool. um, but as a realtor, how is that important to us when we're talking about this is when you go out and do that listing presentation, which we talked about earlier, ask the seller, you know, have you done work on this property? Have you fixed it up? Um, and what have you done? Do you have a licensed contractor and what have you? So that's where this comes into play. So if they tell you, no, I did all the work myself and, you know, and I'm like, well, how much work did you do? Well, we paid about 25 grand. Oh, no licensed contractors, nothing going on. That's a problem. Um, so how do we deal with that? I can't go over that now, but the best thing to do is call the broker, you know, call in and speak to us. We'll talk about full disclosure and everything else that we can so that the buyer know what, knows what's going on. And that's the key to all this is the buyers moving in and do they know what's going on, what's work been done on it. And one of the lawsuits that I'm working on is where the realtor actually went in and told the seller, hey, your house is in such bad shape. And the seller knew it. So it wasn't like he was saying anything bad. And he said, you know what? I do my own fix and flips, which look, he was doing them all illegally anyways. But he <laughs> said, I'll do your fix and flip for you illegally <laughs> and um i'll charge you six percent on the listing but i want ten percent on all your equity that we're going to make off of this property and i'll do this fix and flip so there's like great i'm good with that i'll make a little extra money you do all the work and so the realtor was the general contractor in a way he hired all these people he hired unlicensed people too on top of it and they closed the property and, and a lot of the paperwork wasn't done properly which i'll talk again about um but the point of it is that the buyers who bought it, husband and wife, were both attorneys. And so as soon as they, they bought were. it, they move in, they started seeing things were wrong. Boom, big lawsuit mm. that came about it. So I, I never, I don't ever represent an attorney. I will never sell to an attorney, buy from an attorney, never. <laughs> hey, you know, that, that's in my uh, real estate agency disclosure form at the very bottom. It says, you hold me harmless for all complaints that, yeah. <laughs> that may result well, from this relationship. You never know if the buyer's an attorney or not. He had no clue, you know, and neither did the well, seller. In today's social media world, you need to know. You he didn't know. search, <laughs> yes. Maybe you should search for it a little bit more. All right. The next thing is the use of the general yeah. contractor. And this is the biggest question uh, that I had going in is, you know, when do we need a general contractor on it? So we talked about using licensed contractors, uh, use them um, as much as you possibly can, of course. And before I head over to general contractors, another thing too, is if there's work being done on the property, you as a realtor, don't call and order that work. Please do not do that. As a real Give that information. Be source of the source. Give it to your client. Let them call and schedule it. Let them order it. Let them pay for it. The minute you order it, the minute you pay for it, you're responsible for everything that they do, good or bad, right? And typically it's bad. So um, <laughs> if we have an instant where it goes wrong and they did it wrong, you will have to pay to fix it, not the seller. 
Even though you ordered it for the seller, you're the one who ordered it. All right, back to general contractor. So there's no, it's kind of a gray area. When I talk to the RLC, when they're going to use a general contractor um, in a way of if the job gets so big where you're having multiple contractors out there, they're going to require to use a general contractor. Um, Or if you're doing what they consider significant work on the property. Um, You know, I asked him, I said, what if they are going out replacing all the kitchen cabinets in the house? Do I need a general contractor for that? And they said, yes. The reason why is because when you replace all that, you're moving electrical, you're moving plumbing, and you're doing cabinetry, you're doing multiple Multiple trades trades, in there. And so they're going to say, yes, you need to hire a general contractor to take care of that for you. Of course, putting an ad onto the property, you have to have a general contractor. That's not great there. Uh, But if you're doing, if you hire one guy to go out there and just put a bunch of electrical in, no general contractor. But electrical, plumbing, and maybe one other, probably a general contractor to go in. And when this first came out, we were having these issues. I called multiple general contractors and said, Hey, would you be willing to come in after the fact, review the work and then say, and sign off on it. Right. If somebody paid you to do that, every one of them said, no, (laughs) they're like, there's no amount of money because I I put my name on it for the the next two years. I'm putting my license in the line. So I don't want to do that. Um, so that wouldn't work for them as a use of a general contractor. We talked about the one year after completion. So on a new home, of course, it's a certificate of occupancy. Whether they move in or not is the one year. If you are doing work on the property, um, it is after the last contractor is on the property is the way they completes look at the it. Job. So once he completes that job, the last contractor that, that's there, that's the year date that Begins. starts. Okay. Yep. Uh, so that's pretty simple there. It's one full year. I, I've heard a couple of attorneys out there say 18 months. It's not. Um, it is one full year, 12 months uh, from that time that they're going to look back on. All right. And then the last is this is the number one thing that everybody does wrong. So in the code, specifically, it states that somewhere it says within the contract documents. So it doesn't have to be in the contract, although it's good to be in the contract with an addendum. It could be like an addendum. It can be an addendum. It can be a disclosure. Mm -hmm. Um, It's somewhere in the documents at close of escrow that the seller or the listing agent must include in the package for this buyer is a list of every contractor and their ROC number. Mm -hmm. And it's got to list everyone that's been on there. That's a requirement by law Mm -hmm. to give that to the new buyer. And I can tell you that does not happen at all. Now, we're requiring it if we find out about it um, as a brokerage to make sure everyone's protected. What, what if we're selling the property after the 12-month period? After 12 months, this law doesn't apply. Okay. So good question. Eh? After twelve, after the 12 months, this law doesn't apply. It's just with, during that 12 months. You know, gotcha. If I'm going to sell it within that year, is this stuff going to apply? Now, should after the year, should I give a copy of that contract documents with all the names on it? Yes. You're still going to want to do that, but it's not a requirement by law. But that'll help and protect you if there's a problem with the roof or something. They're not calling you. They'll call the the contractor because technically they have a two-year issue with the ROC on all work that's done uh, by a licensed contractor, which protects a lot of people. Sure does. They don't go back on the seller. I get calls all the time after close of escrow and we find out the seller did the work, you know, yeah. on the property. That's like part of the contract that says that, you know, there are certain things that may have been done to the property that, ex- that go beyond the close of escrow, the part of the, the old seller warranty section from right. years, you know. But again, at this particular point, you can protect your seller or yourself if you just use a general contractor. Right. It's right. an easy story. Well, you do it right, and you don't have to worry about after. Well, right. it's not a, that's not that's I, I, that's not necessarily the issue. It's the issue of knowing what is right. Right it is well today. Right. Yeah, that's you right. know. Yeah, I mean, it's all in that law right there. And, and I mean, we're gonna all want to do what's right. It's just right. a lot of us until today didn't know what right from wrong actually was because we don't really read these laws, and even right. if we do read the laws, we can't interpret them. Well, you know, it's funny because laws, you know, it's really not right or wrong. It's either legal or illegal, right? right, and, right. It, it's on it. So, and in this case here, um, as realtors, we don't, I mean, you'd be surprised on how many times you do deal with this, even if you're not fixing and flipping, how many listings that you um, list where they did some fixing on that property. It's not even a flip. It's just a fix, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it could be fix or it could be a flip, one of the two. Same thing if you're a buyer agent and you're coming in 
And there's still liability on you if you know that, wow, the seller did all this work on the property. Uh, where's the list of all the subs that were on there? We need to get that at close of escrow. I might include that in my offer. Or let's say you find out about that after the fact. Um, you want to, might want to bring that up to them or call the broker so we can bring that up to them so that everyone is compliant and this buyer is protected. Because if you just say, well, they didn't do it. I'm just going to move forward. It closes. Now the buyer has a problem. Guess what? You're going to be included in that lawsuit. Right. Um, and that's no fun. I mean, our e is great. It covers you on the lawsuit on this kind of stuff here. Um, but your time investment on a lawsuit, getting documents, making statements, doing depositions, uh, you'd be better off doing prospecting, doing everything else to make more money yeah. than to deal with, you know, a lawsuit in this kind of scenario. It's expensive. No matter how you look at it, pay me now or pay me later. Yeah. I mean, yeah. time investment is huge. You know, right. people don't realize how much time you invest right. in stuff and how much money you're losing from the time. All right. Well, since we do have a few minutes because Bob is not here and okay. he's sick, uh, we did have a question come in. Interesting question uh, as it relates to the Binzer. Right. So the Benzer now uh, requests fifteen thousand dollars worth of repairs and, and 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 so forth. How does this relate now? To, you know, we're in contract. Um, is it considered still a fix and flip scenario? And and I think the easy question on this one is is no, it's fine. But what if then it falls out of escrow and then the next buyer comes along? How, how would this relate to the Binzer? Right. So I've asked that question too. Does it relate to this law? Yes and no in a sense of it's already sold. It's mm -hmm. under contract, contract, you see. So it's different than it being up for sale. So what happened prior to that? But if you have a bunch of work that needs to be done, and if you look at the contract, right, the contract says all work to be done in a workmanlike manner. So we've always had that argument, do we need a licensed contractor? Do we not need a licensed contractor? Well, can the seller do the work himself? Yes. I mean, he could do it work himself if it's within a workmanlike manner. Now, handyman exemption on it, if we hire someone, if it's over $1,000, the seller must use a licensed contractor. But can he go out and do the own work himself without using a licensed contractor? Unfortunately, yes. Um, even if you add that into the Benzer, because the Benzer is not part of the contract. Right. It's in use of the contract, but it's not part of the contract. So even if you write in the Benzer, all work must be done by a licensed contractor, it's not enforceable right. uh, because it's not um, in there. But does this law apply to $15,000 of work in there? No, and, and I'd say yes. In a way it does is because you have to use licensed contractors right. for doing yeah. certain work. Right. Um, and you have to hire a general contractor when you do in certain work. So no, it doesn't apply, but the contractor and the ROC law still apply to whatever work's being done. So if something were wrong, they could always potentially still cite this, uh, this law and, you know, right. right. But the work that's being done right there doesn't start a year process. Mm -hmm. I think that's what that's the yeah. question is. Yeah. I'm doing all this work. Now, do I have to wait another year if this yeah. buyer drops out? No, because your intent at the time yeah. was for a sale. And that's what it's about with the ROC. What's my intent? My intent is to fix it up and flip it. Or is my intent fixing this up for a current buyer and a contract we have? You see, there's a difference with intent. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, the lesson for me out of all of this is, is, you know, if you're, if you're working with a seller, uh, and you're aware that repairs may <laughs> reach out to you, yeah. you know, just to uh, see what can be done, what can't be done and what paperwork needs to be done and so forth. So. Yeah. And all our brokers here are very well trained and versed on this. Um, so you can reach out to any of our brokers. Um, they, they know about this quite a bit. All right, Mike. Appreciate cool. it as always. Good awesome. stuff. Yeah. All right. Leave you with the quote of the day from Tony Robbins. There is a powerful driving force. We need some music in the background. Yeah, really. There's a powerful driving force inside every human being that once unleashed can make any vision, dream, or desire a reality. reality. Go yeah. out and sell a home.